Good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning for our edition of Up to the Minute. I am Brittany Pacheco filling in for Todd Duplantis, who is on assignment for the chancellor. That means he's in detention. No, I'm just kidding. He's not. Uh, but joining me today, we're going to be talking about supply chain logistics, another high demand career right now in which HCC can help. And we're also going to be talking to our Doc on the Run podcaster and our regular fitness guest. But before we jump into it today, I do want to remind everyone to take a minute to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Be sure to hit that notification bell as well while you're on YouTube. That way you can be the first to find out the latest video uploads from us. And last but not least, we do need your help as our audience to share this podcast so that we can not only grow our audience, but just share this information to those who are not following us. Now, as I mentioned at the top of the show, we're going to be talking about supply chain logistics. And joining me is James Batiste, who is a professor of business management for global supply chain logistics from our business center of excellence. So James, good morning. Thank you for joining us. If we can unmute yourself. Oh, still having some audio troubles. Looks like, there we go. What's that? Top of the day, Brittany. Welcome, to, glad to be aboard to share some exciting information regarding our program today with you and our students. Perfect. And before we turn back to you, James, I do want to welcome Dr. Chris Segler, who is our foot ankle surgeon and former HCC student. So good morning, Chris. Hey, good morning. Thanks for having me on the show today. All right. Just stand by, Chris. We'll look we're looking forward to talking to you about our latest tips because I know a lot of it has to deal with shoes and I love shoes. So uh, we'll first visit with James. So James, I know for a fact that I had no idea what logistics is. So briefly describe what HCC's Logistics Center of Excellence is. Well, thank you. First of all, it's very easy to understand logistics. Once you look at, for example, an automobile, in order for automobile to move, it needs an engine. Logistics is the engine that drives the logistics supply chain. It develops all the processes, procedures that are in place behind the scene to bring about the efficient, effective use of all of the collaborative efforts of everyone in supply chain. In other words, it's the quarterback. It's hidden. It's not known because it is the process and procedures that operate the system. So from a systematic standpoint, logistics is the engine that drives supply chain management. It's a very important system, apparently. So what are some of the employment opportunities here in Houston for logistics? Well, surprisingly, our students currently have been uh, exposed to over 3,000 job positions since the 1st of February with the post-pandemic uh, issues being resolved, even our current students are involved with internships, mentoring, and OJT programs. Uh, the Department of Labor had projected that in the use of metropolitan area, there would be approximately 3,700 jobs available pertaining to logistics. We see that in uh, companies such as Amazon, um, Apple and other major uh, companies as they're gearing up this pre-pandemic efforts to gear back up to normal business practices. Oh, that's very true. And it looks like here in Houston, it, it's a great opportunity that there's annual job openings and there's a, a decent salary, it seems, that our students can benefit from if they come through our program, earn a degree or cer certification, and can get hired. Absolutely. For example, from a salary standpoint, up to $98,000 a year starting salaries, depending on the background, the academic level, uh, and work experience. But basically, at the intro level, we're looking at approximately uh, uh, Amazon at $15, $15 an hour, which is equivalent to approximately $40,000 a year on a full-time uh, basis. So uh, on par, logistics and global supply you will find that their salaries at intro level are probably five to 10% higher than most industries in supply chains of great degree. 
It looks like it. It's it's definitely an industry worth looking into. Absolutely. So I know that there are a lot of different degrees and certificates that our logistics program offers. So can you kind of talk a little bit about the curriculum um, for this? Quite extensive. We have two Associates of Arts degree programs. We have a maritime degree. We also have a basic supply chain degree program, 60 credit hours. Uh, Those are the two uh, degree programs we have. But on the other hand, for those who are primarily work related, we have five certificate programs where they can receive certificates for uh, issuing out, for example, Manufacturing Steel Standard Council has a global recognized certification that we utilize here, that we certify students for, which allows them the opportunities from a standpoint of an entry level position. So our degree programs are those who intend to major in uh, uh, logistics of global supply chain management and enter on into University of Houston or Texas A&M programs. So uh, those students, uh, excellent positions. What is really taking place is it's challenging for them now due to the fact for the high demand for openings and positions that are available right now for people even without their complete degree, if they have the experience or even if they have 60 credit hours, companies are recognizing that important uh, dynamics of what that courses or the degree encompasses, which is uh, eliminates a lot of the questions they may have about the qualification and academic experience of the students. So we have geared and tailored our degree programs to fit the industry standards So, uh, yes, we are academic per se, but we work closely with our industry partners ensuring that our curriculum is in line with where they are in terms of job skills, job classifications. And that's a great segue to my next question about how our logistics courses help our students become job ready. So talk about the simulators that, you know, we have in, in our industry partners. Well, we have several simulators. We have a forklift simulator which uh, handles or trains students on all the different sizes of forklifts, from internal forklifts to crane forklifts. So it's quite varied in terms of the experience that a student can gain through a simulator from that standpoint. In addition to that, we have a container crane simulator, which mimics the operation of loading and offloading of containers off of the ship at the harbor. Those particular skill levels, you're looking at over $100,000 a year, basic start level as a crane operator. So uh, this gives you some incentive to to enroll in the classes, get the exposure, and then our industry partners recognizes the curriculum that we have integrated into those programs, and actually they play a large part in dictating what that curriculum should be. So... All of our simulation is geared to industry standards, industry environments. So uh, it's not just academically solely, but it's also industry related standards that are incorporated in our simulators. I think it's cool about the whole simulators thing. I would love to get behind the wheel of a forklift and try to drive that. But at the same time, I'm afraid. So. So what role does the Logistics Center of Excellence provide students in preparation for working with our industry stakeholders and business community? Are are there internships? Are there, you know, I I see the 60 by 30 Texas. What's all that about? Okay, very good. We work in conjunction with the Texas Department of Workforce in terms of equipping our students for labor intensive jobs. That 30, the 60-30 program is dictated by the state in collaboration with industry again, in collaboration with HCC. So it's a three-tier program where we all dictate or contribute to the development of those programs. Now, part of our curriculum, all of these areas are embedded in our curriculum. So a student, as he enrolls, initially enrolls, he's he has he has avenues to the 60-30 program, he has avenues immediately to internships, mentoring, and co-ops. 
So throughout their two years, let's say, uh, through that certification uh, schedule, they will be utilizing or working with industry as mentors, as interns, doing the, their uh, uh, tenure here at ACC. That's a fantastic opportunity. And it looks like, too, that we have a grant, a DOL grant apprenticeship. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. The key to that program is that for a student in a OJT program at any company that so desires to recruit that student into an on-the-job training program, they will be automatically geared to $15 an hour pay. In addition to that, all of the necessary expenses related to that employee's OJT will be incurred by the Department of Labor through the Department of Labor grant. So the industry very ha, has a win-win situation. The student is in a win-win situation, meaning that the industry is, in, is incentivized to incorporate OJT programs within their uh, uh, companies and also work with us as HCC to integrate those students into those OJT programs as a part of our curriculum. So in other words, as they are in OJT at the work site, we are developing a curriculum as it relates to the specific roles that they're playing within those companies. So that at the end of the OJT, which is normally six months to eight months, they will receive a certification both from HCC in recognition that they have completed all of the standards developed and guidelines of the Department of Labor. The Department of Labor takes that information, they in turn reimburses the employee for the first six to nine months of the salaries that that uh, employee has incurred. So it's a fantastic win-win-win as you can see. We have yes. both federal government, the state level, we have our industry stakeholders locally that are all interested in ensuring that we have qualified workers, employees coming in. This saves them a lot of time in terms of transitions and turnovers because they feel that we are much more college ready to enter into the workforce without any trepidations or issues. So, and again, as you can note, both on the federal level, state level, and with our stakeholders, we are working collaborative. We want our students to be in a win-win situation as it relates to transferring from academics into the workplace. Absolutely. So for a better environment than that. I couldn't agree more, James. This is a great opportunity for our students who are interested in, in getting a, a foot in the door. There's great opportunities here at HCC for our students to learn all about logistics. James Absolutely. Batiste, thank you so much for joining us today. He's the Professor of Business Management and Global Supply Chain Logistics of the Business Center of Excellence. We appreciate your time and all of this great information that you shared with us. Okay, take care. Take care. And for more information about the logistics program here at HCC, visit www.hccs.edu slash logistics. Moving on to Dr. Chris Segler, our foot and ankle surgeon and former HCC student. Hey, Chris. Hey, how are you? Doing great. We're going to talk about one of my favorite topics of all time, and that is shoes. <laughs> so, but we're going to be talking specifically about running shoe selection basics. So what's all that about? Yeah. So, you know, when you go to the running shoes store, there's, of course, an entire wall of shoes to choose from. And so, you know, this is not the routine where you're trying to match your outfit. I mean, you're trying to find the right shoe for you for that given activity so that you can hopefully run as much as you want without getting injured. And, you know, the running shoes are supposed to fit our specific activities and our body type in a way that will actually facilitate that exercise and reduce your risk of injury. That's the name of the game. So, you know, there's a lot to talk about. There's, a, you know, so many different kinds of shoes, but the, the really simple thing is that you can boil it down to really three things, you know, um, and this has to do with three things about your foot type and then three particular types of shoes. So we'll talk about those things. So on that topic, so I generally have like a normal type, you know, arch, if you will. My husband is a little bit more, you know, low arch, almost, you know, flat footed, that kind of thing. So what all goes into 
consideration for shoes when you have those you know differences of arches, let's say? Yeah. So the first thing to think about is exactly what you mentioned. So if you have a normal, you know, ish foot type, right. And no, and and there is no normal. If you compare a hundred people, well, they're not broken up into three distinct categories, but you know, some people have a moderate arch and seem like they have what they would consider to be a normal foot type. And then some people have really low arches or no arches at all. Uh, And some people have really high arches. And what that really translates into it without all the, you know, biomechanical mumbo jumbo is that when you have really low arches, your feet are very flexible. And so because they're flexible and your foot, you know, when it's fully pronated, is kind of like a floppy bag of bones, we need stability to support it. And when you have really high arches, that arch creates a lot of stability, just like an arch that holds up a bridge or, you know, a freeway overpass or a tunnel or something like that. The arch is very, very stable inherently And that means it's very, very rigid. With that rigidity, you actually need cushioning to absorb impact underneath you. So at the two ends of the spectrum, you have flat feet that need, they have too much motion. So you need motion control or stability shoes. And they can be termed either. And if you have really high arches, for some reason, I don't understand. They're called neutral. You think neutral would be in the middle, but it's not. So if somebody says neutral foot type, and they always have these posters that kind of show that at running shoe stores, but Neutral means high arches and you need cushioning Mm -hmm. in between there for somebody like you that has, you know, a typical normal arch. Well, you have a good balance of pronation and supination built into your foot. And so you need some stability and some cushioning. So then you would choose the structured cushioning category. So the three categories, again, are neutral or cushioning. That's the same thing. Motion control or uh, structured cushioning. And so a structured cushioning shoe would probably be right for you because it gives you a little bit of cushioning and padding, but also a little bit of stability to help support and protect you. I'm all about comfort these days, you know, since working from home and, you know, I walk my dog, obviously, multiple times throughout the day. So I definitely want to be comfortable as I'm, you know, taking her out. But I also suffer from knee issues. And I know that shoes will also, you know, help with, you know, the the comfort of, you know, how my knee is performing as well as my lower back and that kind of thing. And for me personally, not endorsed. I would love to be endorsed. Adidas Ultra Boost. They're a little expensive, but man, are they comfortable. That's just my two cents. <laughs> well, that's the thing. You know, you've got to try them on and you have to see what works and what works best for you. And I mean, I get this question all the time for from people who call me for telemedicine visits. And they'll say, well, what shoes do you wear? And they, of course, assume that because I'm a podiatrist and I, you know, have been podcasting on running injuries for years, they just assume that I have the best shoes for everybody. Well, if that was true, they'd only make one shoe but it's ridiculous. And so, you know, I use the best shoes for me, but that's not going to be the same for you. And if the ultra boost works great for you, you should definitely stick with that. And, you know, you, you might do well with a different kind of a Mizuno or a Nike or Mm -hmm. you know anything else, but there's no reason to try it if what you're doing is working. And if you know that it helps to make your knees more comfortable, it helps you feel more comfortable. And that's a good choice for you. Oh yeah, absolutely. My husband, he recently went to a, a, shoe store here in Houston and talk to them about his low arches and things like that. And they made their recommendations as well. So, you know, uh, yeah, everyone is obviously different. He prefers, I think it's uh basics. I think is, is that the brand that's oh, the Asics, Basics? Yeah. Yeah. This yeah, is he, like, this is an Asics running shoe right here, for example. There you go. Yeah. And so, you know, they're all different brands, but even within those brands, you know, part of the advantage of going to a specialty running shoe store is you go in and you say, okay, like this is the, the Asics uh, gel Nimbus. And Mm -hmm. if I went in there and said, okay, I've been running in these, but I don't like the new style. I don't like the the way they feel. Then they would basically look at the wall and because they have an in-depth knowledge of all of the shoes that have changed over the spring and the summer and so on, you know, every couple of months they come out with a new one, they would say, okay, well, this uh, Nike is pretty much like the Asics gel Nimbus or this Saucony or Brooks or whatever is a lot like that particular shoe. And they'd be able to recommend something else that's in the same kind of category uh, that would be helpful. So, you know, it it really is like the Goldilocks and the Three Bears story. You know, you want to make sure that it's not too hard, it's not too soft, and it's just right for you. But that depends upon your foot type. And when you go to the running shoe store, like your husband did, they'll be able to guide you. And, and, you know, it's not a complicated evaluation. They can look at you and they look at runners all day Mm. and then they'll make recommendations. And there's a whole range, just like there's a whole range of foot types. There's a whole range of shoes with varying amounts of stability and cushioning to help support you and make you feel just like Goldilocks. 
And I imagine the shoes are also going to be different for those based on how much running they do. If you're minimalist or if you are like Todd, you know, who runs every day of their lives. So, you know, what, what kind of differences are there for minimal runners and maximum runners? Yeah. So, so this is the thing is when they're also broadly speaking, there are three kinds of different running shoes. You have a conventional running shoe like this. And what it means is that you have uh, uh, a lot of cushioning. It's, it's ethyl vinyl acetate or EVA in the midsole. It's cushioning material. It has uh, a lot of support built into the heel counter, which is very stiff to hold you in position. There's some rigid stuff through the arch so that it won't bend at the arch. It only bends at the toes. Uh, that's a conventional running shoe. It has lots of torsional stability, so it's kind of hard to twist it back and forth. And that's a conventional running shoe. It also... A conventional running shoe, a normal running shoe basically has a, a, what we call a drop. So you'll see this thing about drop where it's the difference in height between the heel and the toes is the drop of the shoe. So this one's 12 millimeters. So 10 or 12 is pretty normal for normal shoes. A minimalist shoes, which you've probably seen somebody wearing those shoes that look kind of like gloves. Hmm. Well, those are true minimalist shoes. Minimalist shoes have very little cushioning, very little support, very little material at all. They're extremely flexible. Uh, but you have to be very strong in order to run in those without getting injured. And a lot of uh, runners who start with minimalist shoes that are well-trained runners, somebody like Todd, who, you know, can run marathons and do Ironman triathlons. If somebody like Todd immediately switched to minimalist running shoes and went out and ran six miles, which is not a long distance for Todd, but it's a really long distance if you're running in shoes with no support or protection. Now, maximalist shoes they look like they're very, very thick. And so they look kind of like really bulky, normal running shoes. But maximalist running shoes are actually very thick soles with a lot of cushioning, but they actually have a very low drop on the heel. And so they're sort of, uh, even though they're, they look like the opposite of minimalist shoes, they're actually designed to protect you while letting you run with minimalist type running form. So in general, I think it's better for people who are going to start running to begin with a conventional type running shoe, get some advice from the running shoe store, get used to running, and then look at the wear pattern on your shoes and go back to the store. And if you're interested in trying something like the minimalist or maximalist shoes, then you take your old running shoes to the store and let them guide you on what might be the best choice for you, giving where you're landing. And we won't get into all that now about, you know, forefoot versus rear foot striking and all this other business, but the running shoes stores have, you know, employees who sell shoes all day and understand all those running biomechanics just as well as I do. And they'll actually guide you on which shoe might be best to transition into if you want to try something different. So what's in store for us next time you're joining us for up to the minute. Well, yeah. So, you know, you talked about how you know that the these shoes feel right for you, right? Like you're very comfortable in those and they work for you. Now, if you were to go and run or walk, you know, hundreds of miles, five or 600 miles over the course of several months, and that's not, it sounds like a lot of miles, but it's not. And somebody like Todd, who's doing, you know, 30 or 40 or 50 miles a week, well, he could, you know, in just a, a short period of time, just a couple of months could rack up that kind of mileage and destroy the shoe. And what happens is that it's very, very gradual. You're basically crushing the material in the midsole. They start to lose support and then they start to wear out. And so next time what we're going to talk about is how you can tell some sort of tricks to, you know, evaluate your own running shoes and tell when it's really time to replace them. Because if you, for example, were to use your shoes too long and you start losing that cushioning and support that's built into them, even though you have a normal arch, you're then at risk of maybe having some knee problems or some back problems, hip problems, whatever, as a consequence of too much motion and too little protection from the shoes. So next time we're going to talk about three tricks to kind of use to evaluate those yourself really simply. Any excuse just to buy new shoes. I'm all there you go. <laughs> That's right. Dr. Chris Segler, foot and ankle surgeon and former HCC student, also known as Doc on the Run. Thanks for joining us today. All right. Thanks for having me. Well, we'll see you next time. And for our news events and announcements this Saturday, it will be freebies and frisbees. At HCC Central, we'll have three events to prepare for this fall, our job and career fair, HCC Central's 50th anniversary celebration, and our admissions and registration fair. Big Saturday is this Saturday, June 5th, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Bring a lawn chair. You're going to enjoy a DJ, eat a gourmet cupcake. I could go for a cupcake right now. Get a T-shirt, throw a flying disc, 
big Saturday will be big fun. We'll have more information on this with the link in our post after the show. So a shot in the arm. The city of Houston is giving Pfizer vaccines at HCC Northeast from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. this week, all the way through Saturday, June 5th. Also, HCC's Acres Homes and Central Campuses are sites for the second Pfizer shot at no cost to the public. The Texas National Guard is giving the shots along with the Texas Department of Emergency Management. Now, once again, that is going on uh, from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. next week, Wednesday through Saturday, June 9th through 12th. And the Texas National Guard is delivering the vaccine at HCC sites in support of eradicating the pandemic crisis in the Houston area. Walk-ins and drive-ups are encouraged and no appointment is necessary. Also, all HCC faculty and staff who receive a vaccine at these locations during scheduled work hours will not be charged leave. MBDA virtual subs and sandwiches with HCC procurement, small business development, they're still up to their shenanigans with <laughs> having subs and sandwiches. So they're going to target minority business enterprises. So Bring your own subs. It is virtual. That's going on next, uh, not next Wednesday. What am I saying? In two weeks, Wednesday, June 16th from 1130 a.m. to 1 p.m. You can check the HSC events calendar to register. The three W's for returning to campus. HCC summer classes are reopening uh, for faculty, staff, and students. And that has already begun, but the chancellor asks everyone to remember the three W's. You are welcome to wear masks, wash your hands often, and watch your social distancing. So just keep those three W's in mind when you're on campus. Gallery Without Walls, our student non-juried exhibition is going on. Student artists from all HCC colleges are showing what they've created this semester on Instagram once again, since campuses, art galleries are still closed. The non-juried exhibition features studio classes from the entire system. We'll put the handle for that Instagram uh, link in our post after the show. And we've already talked about this once before, but I'm going to talk about it again. Summer classes have begun or will begin Monday, June 7th, but registration is still underway for summer as well as fall when students can attend small face-to-face -face classes. So register now. I can't stress that enough. HCC will have five course options, including full-time face-to-face classes as well as hybrid, but they will be small, so registration is crucial. Can't stress that again, y'all. Be sure to lock in those classes, the method that you want early. We still have our online anytime, our online on schedule, our hybrid lab and hybrid courses, which are going to be our lecture and lab courses that meet safely face-to-face -face on campus as well as virtually, and our in-person classes, our safe face-to-face -face courses with traditional meeting patterns. Remember, these new face-to-face -face classes begin this summer, that's next week, June 7th. For registration to all of our HCC programs and to lock in your classes early, head to hccs.edu slash now. And tomorrow, we're going to bring Suzette Brimmer, Dean of the Consumer Arts and Sciences Center of Excellence, who will give us a roundup of the recent Fashion Fusion event and a reminder that if you missed it, it's not too late to catch the winning fashions on exhibit. And it's going to be Thursday, so it's Virtual Family Fun Day, one of my favorite days. And this short week, we will be visited by the Shakespeare Film Festival, which is held at the Miller Outdoor Theater. That's going to be incredibly exciting. So be sure to tune in tomorrow at 10 a.m. with us for Up to the Minute. Todd will be back, but I will be back to co-host. So we'll see you tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. for Up to the Minute. Thank <laughs> you.